so many choices. Mushrooms, pepperonis, banana peppers, bacon, spinach, maybe even some pineapple. But wait, where are the anchovies? What do you mean El Nino ate the anchovies? Welcome to What Is It About the Weather, a podcast where we explore the many ways that weather intertwines itself into our lives. I'm your host, Mark Jelinek. This week, we're going to dab a little in what does your weather pizza look like? But before we get there, as always, I hope your weather week is going well. I, I hit that threshold. I, every year I go through this thing. When, when is it too cold for shorts outside? And I think some of the mornings here finally getting to where, I, you know, maybe I wouldn't normally go out in shorts, but uh, not so cold that certain points in the day where I wouldn't put on shorts and go outside. Went and ran some errands just yesterday, actually, and it was pretty chilly here. Single seas, kind of 40-ish Fahrenheit-wise, and I actually like it. I think, you know, I'm not exactly sure how that happened, but I've always traced it back to I grew up playing soccer at times of the year where it was still a little cold. Either it was getting into winter or, you know, it was spring and, and it hadn't quite warmed up enough yet but I never it didn't bother me being out in the cold so I think I don't know I've always traced it back to that but you'll always find me outside in a pair of shorts except when it gets generally when it's below freezing you, you find me putting on uh, some long pants not that you won't find me in long pants before then but that, that's just kind of my cutoff if you will I'm sure different people have different thresholds but that's mine and of course been a lot of chatter this week about here in the U.S. about weather travel related stuff with Thanksgiving week coming up and a big storm actually that's some of it's even hitting my way tonight. So I'll let you know if I have anything. I, it's it's early enough where I think uh, I don't know that it's going to have a huge impact for unless those you know some people do tra- take off the whole week and travel, so it might do that. And maybe this is a dry run for what we talked about before with the broader global travel season around Christmas. I don't know, other things going on with COVID and stuff might might have some impacts there. But nonetheless, nonetheless, weather and travel have been in the headlines this week. And, you know, I, we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. This is really where I see the play of more likely impacting things. So if you're pl- training, planning to travel for the holidays, maybe keep it in mind. Spend a little more time. Give yourself a little more wiggle room just to accommodate all the potential situations. But I think the, the I, I don't know, I don't often laugh about weather, probably enough, but I had one this week that, that really, it had me chuckling quite a bit. So not surprising, right? I follow a lot of meteorologists on Twitter. Not, it's not a shocking thing, is it? And they, they cover the spectrum in terms of whether they work in, you know, research or the private versus public, whatever it might be. And it also includes, you know, on-air people, but that's both television and radio. So I get, I guess, a lot of perspectives on things, people coming at it from different angles. And a lot of that leads to some serious debates. And and I like it because when you you get just different feedbacks from different groups on thinking about the same problem from, from a different perspective. But one this week had nothing to do with any of that. It just had really struck anybody who's gone to college and studied meteorology, whatever level it is, you probably at some point had to take certain classes that pushed you to a limit of some kind. Now, I'm sure there's some people that could say, well, I found it all easy, but I know I didn't. Um, but the, the tweet that made me laugh was this meteorologist, and I'll put a link in the show notes. So, cause I even responded to it. So you can go look at it. If you're, you don't even have to be on Twitter. I don't think to see the tweet, but his thing says, it says person. Can you recommend me a book that'll make me cry? And it says me. So this was this actually his name is Tyler Rooney. And it's a picture of a textbook that's called an introduction to dynamic meteorology. Now for most people, most people go, I don't get it. I don't get the joke, but for any meteorologist, I mean, I was, I was truly laughing and, and, you know, it made me pull out my copy of a book, which I have on a bookshelf, not too far away from, from my hand. Right. And it was very, very humorous that, that, that just came across. And yes, there are people that I know that I don't know that the textbook made them cry, but the class and the idea of the class, I mean, it, it could be cry worthy. Uh, and and it, it certainly can push you over the limits. So it was kind of a funny moment. Any case, any case, 
If you're traveling this week for Thanksgiving, I just want to take a moment. First, I hope your weather's good, but I do want to take a moment and, and just say thank you to all of you, right? So we all go through good moments and bad moments in our lives, and you you, you always look at those times, and you, you people stand out, right? But for me, one of the things that stands out is you guys is my audience, and there's some of you I've never heard from and never will. But that doesn't make you any less important because there's enough of you listening out there that it makes me want to keep doing that thing. But I you know, particularly want to say thanks to those that have taken the time at some point to say, hey, just you know, enjoy the podcast or here's an idea, whatever it might be. It's kind of taking that extra step at some point. So I'm going to give you the information, right? What is it about the weather at gmail.com or, of course, Mark underscore Jelinek on Twitter or what is about the weather on Twitter? You know, if you reach out this week and say thanks, trust me, I'll say thanks back. All right. But just know you don't even have to do that, but I'm grateful to you. So if you're traveling this week and have some sort of interesting weather thing you want to share, and this reminds you to do that, so be it. All right. But just know that here, yes, I know that not everybody's celebrating it like we are in the U.S. this week, whether whether you're celebrating in the U.S. or somewhere around the globe, if it's not this week, Think of it as a precursor to whenever your equivalent type of holiday is. I'm grateful for you guys, so thank you. All right, we're going to do, hey, we talked about doing a little more, people want a little more science, so I'm going to try this. And just know, though, that the topic we're going to cover could be a whole semester-long class and more, right? The, the, when the sheer volume of research that's been done around this could go on and on and on. And I literally could go on and on and on. But what I'm going to try to do is capture in the next 15 minutes or so some fundamentals around one scientific topic. All right? Because it's been in the headlines quite a bit here in the U.S., but it's relevant to uh, billions of people around the globe. Now, we've had some episodes going on in the western U.S., things called atmospheric rivers, things called bomb cyclones, over the past couple weeks, but I'm not going to cover those. Maybe in a future episode, like those are topics I could get into as well. But I thought one I would hit one that is likely everybody that listens has heard of it before to some degree and has in some respect probably been told that their weather is impacted by this thing. And that's La Nina. We're headed what looks like to be into another La Nina year. So I thought I'd take some time and say, Here's what it is for those that don't know it. For, hopefully there'll be some tidbits in there for even those who are familiar with it that you learn a little more, all right, and you know a little bit more about it. But I'd like to give everybody some core basis for what it is and why it matters to you, all right, what's relevant to you. So we're going to start with a little bit of science, but then we're going to translate it. So I guess it's really not going to be 15 minutes of science per se. Tricky thing, like I said, going from that one-minute intro version of it to the 15 minute version and I'm already wasting time even saying that. So we're going to get going, but we'll see how good of a job I do or don't do and all that. All right. But we're going to start with a term called ENSO. Now there's a reason for doing that, but you may or may not have heard that term before, but it stands for El Nino, which most of you will probably have heard of and Southern Oscillation, which most of you probably have not heard of. But in the scientific community, when we talk El Nino, La Nina, we talk about it more broadly, usually, as we call it ENSO. And the reason is that Southern Oscillation piece is actually an atmospheric response or relationship that is closely connected with the atmosphere, taking the atmosphere to the oceanic part, which is the El Nino and La Nina component. Okay. So even that name incorporates the complexities of what we're talking about here because one influences the other, but the other it comes back. There's, you know, feedback loops going on here. So it's not the ocean acting independently or the atmosphere doing that. They're both interchanging with each other. And, you know, it has to do with the way just the planet orbits. So it's even more fundamental than either one of those things. But from a, New standpoint, when you hear the word La Nina or you hear El Nino, what those things actually refer to is a state of a pool of warm water in the Pacific Ocean. Okay. And where that thing is, when it's neither El Nino or La Nina, 
is what we would call the neutral phase, right? But because the Earth spins <laughs> and we have airflow generally at the equator that goes from east to west, across the globe. This is kind of a, a global thing. It's not some sort of you know, regional effect. If it's different, it's because it's a regional effect. And that general flow tends to push water. That's not surprising. Anybody that's ever been on a boat knows, right, that the wind blows and it pushes something in a direction. And yes, that means it pushes the water as well. It can drive current flows, that sort of behavior. What this means is there's a pooling of warm water. And that warm water then, all right, it, it drives a behavior in the atmosphere because you're getting, you know, convective behavior, that nice warm water. And this is like how hurricanes, tropical cyclones are fed as well. You get a nice pool of warm water and it feeds the atmosphere, right? And where that feed zone fits up and flows, it creates something that we call a wall circulation that then disperses and goes back to the east. So we've had this from east to west and now it's going from west to east and then it comes back down again, right? And it kind of creates this circle in the atmosphere. But as you can imagine, that little pool of warm water doesn't always sit there for a variety of reasons. Maybe maybe it cools from a lot of rain, as an example. That's one feedback mechanism. Maybe the winds are stronger or weaker. Okay, All these things come to influence it, and it's influenced from below as well. How the ocean is behaving underneath due to thermoclines and the very cool deep ocean versus the warmer near-surfaced part of the ocean. Okay, All those things come into play. And they're all involved in the feedback process. But ultimately, what we're concerned about is where that pool of warm water is. And when it's further to the west, we get what's called a La Nina phase. And when it's further to the east, we get an El Nino phase. Now, when we first started studying this phenomenon, that's what you had. You had kind of a neutral, an El Nino or La Nina. But as we've learned more, we've also come to understand that it's not just that simple, right? That... We want to understand where that pool is, even when it's in the west, and where that pool is in the east, because that might mean something different, or how anomalous that warm pool is. Is it really, really warm, or is it really far west, or is it really far east? All these things drive a different potential response, and that's not surprising to any of us, right? No two things are exactly alike, right? How blue is blue? You know, what's a small shirt size, right? And it depends on who makes it, right? And, and, and what fashion says that given year. So the same's true for this sort of phenomenon, is even though we might call it a La Nina or an El Nino, it isn't always the same. They're not always exactly the same. And I am going to put some links in the show notes where you can do a little deeper dive on this and you can. Go as deep as you want. I mean, there's one of the links I'll put in there. You could get lost in for months, probably. Right? But fundamentally, what we're talking about is what is the state of the Pacific, this pool of water in the Pacific Ocean? And then when it gets translated to us, what becomes important is what does that mean for our weather? Now, usually, it's peak phase most often is in the Northern Hemisphere winter. Not always, all right? But generally speaking, that's when things tend to peak, okay? So that's why some of the strongest influences are during that time. But it can also occur in, we tend not to see the strongest responses in the spring, fall. We tend to see them in the winters, if you will, both Northern and Southern. But its strongest phase quite often, quite often, is in the Northern Hemisphere winter, okay? But like I said, depending on where, the strength sets up, we might have very different responses. And that's what we've learned over time and why when you first heard this being talked about you know, a few decades ago, there was like, okay, that translated into this type of weather for California. And, and actually, California is one of the big places here, large population, sixth largest economy. I think that's what the current state is, sixth largest economy in the world, right? Lots of things going on there. And they deal with droughts quite regularly. And so they deal, and this is why it's important that to certain areas, maybe more than others, is some places like where I am, we get rain kind of on and off throughout the year. Yeah, you have wetter, drier seasons, but you can kind of get rain anytime. But there are certain places around the globe that tend to get it in seasons, right? That you have what's called a monsoon season when you get your rains. And 
if an El Nino or La Nina can drive a change in that behavior, you can end up with a severe drought or a lot of rain or atmospheric rivers as an example. But the problem we've had is we used to forecast based on that and then we learned, oh, it truly doesn't always work out that way. And that's, that's the real rub, right? Is great. So you're telling me there's a La Nina or El Nino. What does it really mean to me? What do I do with that information? Okay. So let's take a step back and maybe think about it a different way. Like I said, it becomes a big topic because billions of people are influenced by what that positioning in the ocean has to do with the corresponding behaviors in the atmosphere. Okay. And I don't know about you guys, but I watched the great British baking, I forget what, bake off or whatever it's called. Great British baking show. And I was watching an episode this week and it, it made me think about this and it's not the perfect analogy. And that's, we're going to get into the pizza in a moment. But you think about when you make some of the desserts they make that usually they have some sort of foundation layer. Okay. And that can be like a chocolate cake or it can be, you know, any sort of flavor that's the base flavor. But a lot of times they'll make the base flavor not to, you know, it's, it provides some canvas and art, if you will, something to build upon that you can accent and go in a variety of directions, depending on what you want to do that day. You could have that same basic cake and do other things. And the best way to think about El Nino or La Nina is it's setting up a state for things to happen in the atmosphere generally a certain way, but maybe not specifically a certain way. And I, I read an article just this week that La, this La Nina that we're going back into makes the Great Lakes region here in the U.S. tends to make it a little warmer, which means maybe more snow or maybe more rain. And you go, well, that doesn't make any sense. Well, it, what it boils down to is just because it can be warmer overall doesn't mean it's going to be that way every day, right? When you think about El Nino or La Nina, the, the, probably the most important part to think about is that while it's driving these general states in flow changes in the atmosphere, it does so and it changes very slowly, right? And anybody, you get in a bathtub, right? And if you've ever sat in a bathtub while it's still filling up, you know you have this, well, it, it's actually a perfect example, right? There's this pool of warm water that forms right by the spigot, assuming you like a warm bath. And maybe you try to swig shit around a little bit, move that warm water to you, okay? But it doesn't change instantaneously. you got to put in some effort. If you just turned off the spigot, it would take a while for that warmth to spread out and even out, right? And that's assuming that you don't have other things going on. But a lot of times we create that momentum in the tub to bring it to us, and that pushes actually some of the cold water in the other direction. And eventually it settles out. Well, El Nino, La Nino, El Nino, La Nina get into the idea that you know, the earth's a little bit more like a pendulum at times as if you push everything one way, then eventually it's going to swing back to the other. Quite often it doesn't ever get to a neutral phase or it doesn't ever hang out at what we would call the, the non-state of the neutral But we also know that it's not instantaneous. And so with El Nino, La Nina, it's not, it can last a couple of years, right? Or a state can take that whole winter season to slowly start to migrate back to a different direction or to reverse sign, Okay. And because of that, like I said, it draws dry, it might drive some broad behaviors, and it might do it for a period of time, like the winter time. It might make the conditions more favorable for a certain setup because we've learned more about it depends where the La Nina is. So to say it's a La Nina, it's not that simple. It's going to depend on how strong it is, where exactly that pool is, because that might be just enough to say, hey, it is actually colder in, you know, a little further in the north, and it's warmer a little further to the south, but where that dividing line is might have a lot to do with where you get rain versus snow, okay? And that's just in a broad sense. That's not every individual storm. We're not saying that all of a sudden magically everything's controlled. We're building that base layer, okay? And I'm going to switch to pizza here because I think that's something everybody's probably familiar with. And imagine it this way. Underlying the pizza, you've got a crust. And you can have different types of crust. And there are things that happen on this planet, and I've mentioned a couple of them before, that can trigger behaviors that last years, right, beyond the seasons. And so that's maybe the crust. So maybe El Nino La Nina is more like a pizza sauce, right? Do you like a red pizza or a white pizza? 
Okay. They're going to probably drive you to very different flavor spectrums in the end, but you can bring them back towards each other. And it's also not easy to change. Once you put that sauce on there and you kind of start cooking it, you're kind of stuck with it until the next time you have pizza, right? And you can change it to a different flavor. But as you add each component to the top of that, you can go in all sorts of different directions and you might do a half and half pizza. Ah, you split the snow versus the rain, right? But more or less, you end up with a situation where it's all those little flavors that you add to it that define what the final pizza actually tastes like and what you remember about the pizza. So you may have set yourself up with an El Nino pizza. Maybe it's a El Nino is a red pizza, right? And that's going to give you a certain flavor spectrum that you're going to work with. But how much sauce you put on, maybe what even the ingredients are in that sauce. Maybe it's a spicy red sauce. And that's a whole different type of pizza, right? Or maybe, like I said, it's a white pizza. And that tends to take you away from that tomato acidic sort of behavior to something else. But if you have certain cheeses that go into your white sauce, you may bring some of that acid back in. So it, the underlying thing is with whether you get El Nino or La Nina, just understand that that's a piece of the equation. It's a layer in the process. It dictates kind of maybe, and this is the thing, maybe depending on how strong or its positioning, what your weather might be like in a broad sense during that winter season. But it's not going to capture all the events or everything going on. And the funny thing is, really, with El Nino, is one of the places we first learned about it was from cold water being upwelled near the coast of South America, specifically Peru, and in El Nino's, it didn't. It was the warm water was pooling in that direction. And that caused a kill off of some overfished, but some kill off of anchovies. Right? So if you wanted anchovies in an El Nino year, it got a little tougher. And like I said, I don't put anchovies on my pizza, but I know a lot of people do. So just remember the next time. You're thinking about putting anchovies on your pizza or not? That there's much more to the weather than the weather itself.